American Meadows is on a mission to make your yard better with meadowscaping. Goodbye traditional turf lawn, hello thriving yard that's better for you, better for your community, and makes the world a better place. From low-growing micro clover to boldly colorful wildflowers, American Meadows has the products and advice you need to succeed. Visit us at AmericanMeadows.com and use promo code Let's Argue to save 20% on plants, seeds, and bulbs. American Meadows. Meadowscaping makes it better. Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants. But not always the same ones. I'm Carol Collins. I'm associate editor at Fine Gardening Magazine. And I'm Danielle Sherry. I'm the executive editor of Fine Gardening. Oh, Lord, and I'm sweating. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we are rolling towards the end of summer here. And uh, Carol, I got to say, this is the perfect uh, end of summer episode to do. We're going to talk about summer color, plants with excellent summer color today. And I tended to, since we are at the end of summer, I, I picked options that were, you know, looking good now and look good towards the end of, of this uh, sultry season. Yeah, same. I, okay. I also yes, because um this is the this is what I've been waiting for. I feel like I've kind of got a late summer garden, uh more than an early summer garden. So this is yeah, this is our time. <laughs> well, so I was really curious because I had seen a recent Instagram post from you about um annuals that are really coming into their own. And I know that you do a lot of annuals from seeds. So are there annuals that made it onto your list today? Just one, just one, okay. because I know annuals aren't for everyone, but I've got one that's really good. Okay. All right. I like it. So if you're looking for, you know, I'm the opposite. I feel like I don't have enough color in my garden right now. I have, you know, a few things that are, are putting on a show, but I'll be perfectly honest. My neighbor's garden right now looks better than mine. So I'm going to be featuring one of their plants that just captivated me. Um, all right. Let's, let's kick it off. Let's get this sultry episode going. So which, uh, which plant made the top of your list? So this is one, it's sort of inspired by you because I know how you feel about Caryopteris. So this is a Caryopteris that I bought last year, impulse bought at a flea market, and it's called Dark Night. Um, oh. And Caryopteris, people call it blue mist shrub or blue beard, but um, this is Caryoptis, Caryopteris ex clandinensis. And Dark Knight is the cultivar because it has a slightly darker flower. It's hardy from zones seven or five to nine, five to nine, so pretty hardy. Um, this is a small shrub. It, it it's, gets about two to three feet tall and wide, and it likes full sun, average to moderately moist soil. And the only thing it's fussy about is that the soil absolutely has to be well drained. And that's true for a lot of plants, as we know. Um, it's a garden origin hybrid. And so it was discovered in cultivation as a cross between Caryopteris incana and Caryopteris mongolica, I think is how you say it. Maybe that th these are both uh, cultivar or both species that come from Eastern Asia. Mm -hmm. So maybe Mongolica has something to do with Mongolia. Mongolia? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think that's I a know. good guess. We're going to go with that. You know what? It's our podcast. We can we can make claims that don't need to be backed up. Well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> maybe maybe we'll get letters. But anyway, two Asian species. And you know I love my natives, but I'm also okay with benign non-natives. And I, I say this is one of them. Um, the pollinators absolutely love it and know what to do with it. So there's no complaints from that side of my garden. Um, so this is one that you can cut back in the spring if you want to, because it blooms on new growth and it is a really fast, vigorous grower. So whether it dies to the ground or whether you cut it back to the ground in spring, um, it will rebound, it will reach that full size by the end of the summer, and it will start blooming 
I've seen sources that say it starts blooming in July. That has not happened for me yet, but I do get start getting flowers in August and September. It blooms over mm -hmm. a nice long period. And the other thing is not just about the flowers, it has fantastic foliage. It's got these little strappy leaves, silver on the back side. So when you know it has great motion because the two sides of the leaves are different. When the wind hits it, it looks really cool. And most of the time it really looks kind of silvery. So it's a nice punctuation in the border even before the uh, flowers hit in late summer. So I feel like it, you know, it works hard all season, really. I have it near my Sun King Aurelia that you gave mm -hmm. to me. And it's a real, it's a nice counterpoint to colors like that, like a bright chartreuse. I had also nearby is my Black Hawks big blue stem. So I got Ooh, purple. What an awesome combo. That's yeah. a great combo. Yeah, I just, I, I feel like it looks good with any other color, even just plain green, but it really pops against these other, you know, other foliage colors. So I, yeah, I just love it. Um, I would describe the flower color as sort of a dark forget-me-not blue. And they're, because it's blue mist flower. It's, it does, it looks kind of misty. It's got a very fine texture and just, it covers itself in the flowers at the end of the season. So when I bought this, in fall last year, it was in full bloom. And I said, whoa, I've got to have that. <laughs> it is. It's such a rare color, too. You know, we always talk about blue, like a true blue being rare and um, especially dark night because it takes that hue and it's just a super saturated blue, which I really appreciate, which I really, really like. Um, and you are not wrong about the pollinators. I have seen Caryopteris, several, you know, many different types on so many pollinator lists because it keeps going through, you know, into fall when there's not a whole lot happening for the pollinator. So in my garden, same thing. It's almost like, oh my God, guys, last open bar, everybody get to this shrub, you know, get up, get up. You know? So I, uh, yeah, I, I'm so thrilled with that pick. We can end the episode here as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> All right, so this is definitely Freaky Friday. You started off with a shrub and I'm gonna start off with a perennial. Um, I think that this time of year, you look around and in other people's gardens, garden phlox, phlox paniculata looks beautiful, looks stunning. Um, I've never had success with garden phlox because despite them always saying, oh, this is the new and improved mildew resistant variety, it always gets mildew in my garden. You know, David, who's held above all others as being this mildew resistant phlox, just got covered with powdery mildew in my garden. Um, I think that's partially just because, you know, we've been getting uh, more and more humid in the summers. And I also live on the edge of a wetland. So I feel like I do have a, a little uh, kind of moist microclimate going on. But I will say years and years and years ago, we got some sample phloxes and I needed to fill a hole. So I shoved coral cream drop garden phlox and that's phlox paniculata. Did a, it's ditto madeir, ditto madeir, zones three to eight. I shoved this in a hole and I was just like, oh, all right, well, if it only does its thing one year and gets powdery mildew, I'll rip it out next year when I can actually find a plant I want. And this thing has just impressed me over and over and over again over the years. Um, it has not gotten a stitch of powdery mildew in my garden for the last, I don't know, five years or so. It's beautiful. This time of year, obviously, it is coming into full bloom and it continues through August. It is a dark, dark, deep coral. It has kind of a... Uh, almost burgundy magenta eye to it with just a touch of white. So it really does look like it's looking at you. Um, the great thing about this flox is that it also is held by these dark purple calyxes. So even when the blossoms drop off those individual, they almost look like little pinwheel flowers and they kind of come in this puffy cotton candy -ish shape. When each one of the flowers drops off, it looks like it's still blooming because of those purple calyxes, you know, a lot like a, a lot of the salvias that we have featured on this on this podcast. Um, it is short and compact, so it also doesn't get ginormous and run all over the place either because um, it is a very, very well-behaved flocks, which 
also seems weird because phlox, garden flocks is not well behaved. Um, this is clearly a native R, um, you know, garden flocks, phlox paniculata is native to North America. And this is a, a cultivar that was a naturally occurring uh, um, seedling that had popped up. So it is full sun. It likes moist, well-drained soil. And I'll just amend that to say that I have it in a very terrible spot of lean, dry, not very fertile soil. And it still does awesome. But um, expect one to two feet tall and wide. Mine over the years, perhaps because of lean soil, has only stayed in about the 18 inches by 18 inches realm. And um, it's just beautiful. And every year I go, all right, I'm ready for you to get mildew and I'll rip you out. But it doesn't. It must hear me. And my threats have worked. I, <laughs> is the mildew afraid of you? I don't know. Maybe not on other things. Not on other <laughs> things. Geez, this year, my nine barks have a little bit of powdery mildew, but not the phlox. I don't know. I think the phlox is scared of me. All right, Carol, are you going to do another shrub and I'll do another perennial and we'll just call this like the weirdest flip flop episode ever? I'm uh, no, I'm going to go with my annual and just, you know, okay. put him right out there. And um, but, but this is one this is one that I think I had done as a wish list item a um, couple years ago when we do our wish list, like at the beginning of a new year. And at that point, I had never successfully grown Mexican sunflower, but mm -hmm. I've been growing it for a couple years and I love it. And I think this is going to join the yearly lineup of the annuals that I grow, which is a very quickly expanding list, <laughs> uh, much to my chagrin. But this is, this is a gorgeous, gorgeous plant native to Mexico, as you might guess from the common name. It's Tithonia rotundifolia, and it is annual. I do not believe that it is uh, a perennial, even in zones 9 to 11 or whatever. But it likes full sun, as you can imagine, sunflower, dry to average, well-drained soil. It loves the summer heat, just loves it. And it really shines in the second half of the summer. So it does bloom from a long period for a long period, but that starts around midsummer, say like somewhere in July typically. And then it just goes right through until frost. And it, it gets big. These things get, oh, I'd say six feet tall and th two or three feet wide. So it's very upright. It has very, very sturdy stems. It has never flopped for me, except in the situation where I had it crowded in with other plants and it just wasn't getting the light it needed. But if it has a spot in the sun, it will stand up for you through thick and thin through the whole season. Um, I start my seeds six to eight weeks before our final last frost. A lot of the time they spend outdoors. Like I don't have them under lights. I'm moving them in and out so that they're getting real sunlight and that helps them get off to a really good start. And then when I set them out in the garden, I put them at least two feet apart from each other. And I like to plant, you know, like six or eight of them in one location and then you get this big mass of the gorgeous felty foliage and then these flowers um one of the other common names for this is red sunflower but it's not really red it is reddish but it has uh streaks of sort of a flame orange and sort of an undertone of a golden yellow and so I put in the show notes, I put a close up of one of the flowers so you can see it's almost like someone has brushed several shades of orange and red and yellow, uh, layered it onto each petal. Like, you know, it's very artsy looking. Bees, butterflies, hummingbirds all love it. Um, I, I sent one of these to my mother-in-law this year, along with some other seedlings. It is her favorite. She goes out every day. She, she will text me how many flowers there are on it. Um, you know, it's bringing the butterflies around, which is another, you know, late season color kind of thing when you can have a plant that's going to bring in the butterflies and like bonus color from butterflies. Um, there seem to be all kinds of things that eat the petals of the flowers. Like sometimes you'll have just the center of the flower left after some little critter has eaten the petals. I don't, I don't mind that things eat the leaves. That seems like it means it's a healthy part of our ecosystem and it never ends up looking too tattered. It's really quite a 
tough customer for as pretty as it is. Um, I don't know. It's a favorite. Definitely, definitely part of my short list. If I wasn't growing other things, I would be growing this. And you can all you can start it from seed right in the ground. I just like to have that head start of uh, getting it going before the last frost. Yeah, that I've always seen Tithonia um, grown a lot in flower fields as fresh cuts um, because it does last pretty long in a vase as well. Correct. Yes. And it, and the individual flowers, it's sort of like a spray of flowers. Each one has a nice long stem. So it would it would make a great cut flower and they do last quite a long time in the vase. That's yeah, awesome. They're, they're I'm going to. I, I I am gonna add that to my to my list for next year because I'm not you know this was a little bit tough of an episode for me too because I'm not in love with orange or red like that those don't tend to make it into my garden that much I've loosened up on my no pink um you know and this was I loosened up far before Barbie the movie became very popular I loosened up a little bit and and have allowed some pink into my garden but yeah red and orange is tough for me I, I don't know why but Ithonia is a attractive attractive annual so maybe I'll have to I'll have to broaden my horizons if you will um well so I brought in my horizons over to my neighbor's house the other day because as I mentioned at the top of the show they have a gorgeous summer garden a lot of you know late blooming daylilies over there a lot of daisy things and you know in the daisy family the chrysanthemum family but one thing that totally caught my eye was uh sombrero granada gold cone flower and that's echinacea balsam mold <laughs> so that's one that i'm really glad they changed the name on and made it a trademark name sombrera granada gold sounds way better than balsam mold um and that's zones four to nine uh my neighbors tom and kathy had planted this one um i believe last year if not the year before in their garden and it looks so good right now they planted it next to a St. John's wort, um, a hypericum, a small dwarf hypericum. So this gorgeous, melony, yellow, orange cone and petal, cone flower is doing its thing. You know, each one of the flowers is probably close to two and a half inches across, you know, the disc. And then the St. John's wort right now is in full berry. So you've got these beautiful burgundy berries. So I'm giving you a two for one here, guys, because both of these are putting on summer color at the same time. And they're just kind of intermingling together. And you'll see in the show notes, if you go to finegardening.com, everybody, click on that podcast tab. You'll see the show notes and pictures and lists from all the plants we mentioned today. But that photo was just such a captivating combination. Um, They've done wonders lately with cone flowers. You know, cone flowers used to be just, you know, Echinacea purpurea, where you could expect it to be, you know, probably 24 inches tall, a little flopsy mopsy, a little more prairie ish, which there's nothing wrong with. But this is one of the, the more shorter, compact versions that they've come up with lately and as a cultivar. So this Granada gold cone flower only gets 18 to 20 inches tall and wide. And it is a compact little wonder, multi-stemmed, very, very, uh, you know, just kind of cinched up together. Really, really nice. Um, so I already mentioned that the petals and the cones are the same color, which is not always the case with various different cone flowers. And it puts on a show for weeks and weeks. Um, the other thing that I like is when you leave the spent gone by blossoms in place, Goldfinches go absolutely bananas over that center boss cone that's just filled with seeds. And you'll see them just, you know, go into town like a chef in the kitchen, you know, pulling seeds out left and right. And it's just such a beautiful sight. And they really do have some nice winter interest, too. If the birds leave anything behind for those seed heads, they look beautiful in winter, kind of dusted with some frost. But um. This cone flower, as with most echinaceas, is drought tolerant once it's established, which has become kind of key in a lot of areas of the country that have gone super dry now during the summer. Um, it's salt tolerant. It's a North American native R, um, and it's full sun, well-drained soil. It does need a bit of moisture to get established. I will say that with most cone flowers, it's not a set it and forget it plant, but once you get it through that first season, they pretty much take care of themselves. So. Um, 
um, again, that's Sombrero Granada Gold Coneflower. And it just makes me want to go on a vacation to Granada. Hey, Carol, um, any coneflowers in your garden? Because I feel like that is such a, you know, late summer staple in a lot of gardens. I only have one. And honestly, I cannot remember the name of it, but it came from the All America Selections. They send seeds out. So this is um, a coneflower you can grow from seed. Um, I don't know the cultivar. It is a yellow one. So okay. we'll see. But I, it, I don't believe it will bloom this year. This is the first year from seed. So I'm guessing if it blooms, it'll be next year. Okay. And uh, we shall see, but I, I like the yellow coneflowers. Richard Hockey says that, you know, the yellow coneflowers, like why bother? Because that's Rebecca's job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree. I, it's a different look. I, I like the, the center cone is not being brown on some yeah. yellow flowers. Yeah. Yeah. And I will say with that Granada gold, it is, it, like I would almost call it a melon yellow, you know, it's not that acid caution, rude Beckia, like, ah, stop, stop yellow. It's definitely a different, a different yellowy firm. So we'll have to check back in with you and how the success went with the next year on, on your yes. yellow cone flower. This, this time right. next so, year. I'll, yeah. I'll by then. <laughs> It'll be on the list. Um, yeah. All right. So what, uh, what did make the list for your third plant? Okay, so this is a plant and you're going to say late summer color. Wait, what? It is small yellow wild indigo, Baptisia tinctoria. And oh, it, it, the name of. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. It's, a, it's a Baptisia that blooms after the other ones. And in my garden, that means it has started blooming in July-ish most mm -hmm. years. Um, but... I was looking up different sources. What did they say the bloom time was? And there, and I think this must vary by region. This is a plant that has a huge native range. So, you know, basically the whole Eastern half of the United States, I think. And so they're saying it blooms anytime between April and September, but it blooms over a very long period. So no matter where you're falling in that window, it's going to be after your other Baptisias and then, um, you know, like it continues for a month or more, maybe two months. 